Okay, welcome to this lecture on the functional organization of the central nervous system. Um, although specifically what we're going to be looking at in this lecture is the spine. We'll be looking at the brain in a separate lecture. So in this exciting episode we are going to discuss the spine and specifically we're going to look at the tracts of the spine because if you understand the tracts you already understand about 99% of what the spine is on about in terms of the central nervous system um, organization. And there are two types of tracts. We've got ascending tracts and descending tracts. And um, the names of the tracts I will often give you a clue as to um, what the tracts um, do. For example, um, one of the ascending tracts is referred to as the spinothalamic tract. And if you look at the name and you divide the name into two portions, the first portion will be where the tract is anatomically coming from and the second part will be where the tract is anatomically going to. So this particular tract, the spinothalamic tract, is going from the spine towards the thalamus of the brain. So it's, in other words, going up from the spine into the brain. So already from the name, you already know that this is an ascending tract, and you already know that its uh, destination is the thalamus um, of the brain. So ascending tracts, uh, if they're going from the periphery to the central nervous system, that means they're taking uh, sensory information from the periphery towards the brain. So they are, for the most part, um, sensory tracts. In contrast, the descending tracts, which are, for the most part, uh, motoric tracts, carrying motor information of how to move the periphery um, from the brain. But in the same way that um, the name of the some of the ascending tracts can give you a clue as to their anatomy in the same way descending tracts can also give you clues in terms of their naming so let's take for an example the corticospinal tracts and let's also divide that into two and in the same way the beginning is from the end is two so this is from the cerebral cortex towards the spine so already from the name you know that starts in the cerebral cortex, you know it's descending towards the spine so you know that this is a descending tract. So I can give you the name of a tract and you should be able to work out whether it's an ascending or descending tract simply by looking at the name. This is not true for all of the tracts, some of the tracts are not named so conveniently and anatomically uh, but many of them are so it's a good thing to keep in mind. So first of all we're going to start off by discussing ascending tracts so ascending tracts uh, there's about six of them so there's about six of them and they carry sensory information from the periphery and the type of information they carry is touch now it's not as simple as that because there are actually multiple types of touch for example, there's the sense of vibration, which is a sense of touch in and of itself. Um, the sense of pain, let's give that a nice angry red color. The sense of position, or to use a more scientific term, proprioception. Deep touch. light touch, with deep touch being touch that you can feel in the, uh, deeper into your tissues and light touch being the touch that you can only feel uh, on a uh, superficial um, level on the skin. Crude touch, which is touch that is difficult to localize a specific point. Its opposite is discriminative touch, touch that you can localize to a specific point. Tickles are a type of touch. Itch is also a type of touch. Temperature 
is a type of sensory signal or sensory touch uh, that you detect uh, with your uh, or that information that's carried within the ascending tracts and that's quite important for body temperature regulation because the hypothalamus of the brain regulates your body temperature um, based on what temperature information it is receiving from the periphery and the feeling of pressure on your body is a separate type of touch and these all these different types of touch have to go up uh, from your peripheral nervous system and enter your central nervous system and then once they've entered the central nervous system they have to go up specific ascending tracts. Uh, now the problem is the ascending tracts carry different groupings of these touch sensations and these groupings don't really make much logical sense um, uh, they don't make any sort of um, proper um, groupings or patterns uh, they're very much randomly sort of thrown together into the different tracts um, and unfortunately knowing which tract carries what is uh, basically dependent on brute force memorization um, there's not much to understand in terms of how the um, uh, sensations are grouped together in the different tracts the other thing that um, throws off um, um, uh, how, uh, the, that throws off the ease of uh, learning these tracts um, besides the fact that there's so many different types of touch these tracts, these six tracts, they all decussate sorry that's a terrible S, they all decussate at different levels. Decussation basically um, is where they swap sides so generally um, if we draw a very anatomically correct picture of a human being here with an arm, shoulder, head, other shoulder that's a terrible chest but anyway okay so if we have a let's say a light touch sensation in the hand um, Sorry, rather, let's rather make that a deep touch sensation, so we're involving the cuneate fasciculus. We have a deep touch sensation in the periphery, and that signal then goes through our peripheral nervous system, and then finally it enters our central nervous system by entering the spine over here. Now, then it ascends, and then will swap over in the brainstem, and then go to the cerebral hemisphere, on the opposite side of the body. In other words, it decussates, it swaps sides. Now, this particular deep touch signal will decussate um, in the brain stem over here, but some um, ascending tracts will decussate soon after they've um, entered, um, or they'll decussate at different levels of the brain stem or the brain, and that makes um, the ascending tracks a bit tricky to sort of memorize in the sense that they swap over at different sides and furthermore because they swap over at different sides if you have lesions involving uh, only one side of the spine for example you might have um, bizarre clinical presentations because some signals um, will have decussated very quickly so for example one signal might have already decussated and might be coming up the spine here so you lose your deep touch sensation for the right arm but some other sensations are preserved because they decussated before the lesion and they're still able to go up and and go to the uh, relevant uh, cerebral hemisphere so that can make very, for very tricky clinical presentations where there's only half of the spine uh, damaged or, or blocked as it were um, and some signals can get through and some signals are blocked because of this decussation so let's quickly draw a cross section of the spine Oops, got my pen here we go let's quickly draw let me get a new piece of paper So let's draw a cross section of the spine. It looks something like this.
and in the middle of all that we have our grey matter which takes a sort of butterfly shape I'm sure this is not anatomically 100% correct but for the sake of explaining explanation I'm sure it is accurate enough and that's the spinal canal now the first track that we're going to have a look at is the cuneate fasciculus unfortunately this is one of those ascending tracts that uh, the names don't um, offer any clues as to what kind of tract it is and where it goes um, but here we go it's the cuneate fasciculus let me just add fasciculus over here and obviously there's one for each side of the spine and the cuneate fasciculus carries um, a certain um, grouping of sensations I like to remember it as V, V, D, D, P the first B, V being for vibration, so it carries vibration sense it also carries visceral pain Whoops, visceral pain so in other words, if you cut yourself um, on the hand superficially on the skin and you feel that, that pain the cuneate fasciculus is not the one that's going to carry this pain information but if, on the other hand if you break a bone in your arm then the cuneate fasciculus will carry that internal visceral pain uh, towards the brain also carries deep touch so these two kind of make sense uh, visceral pain being deep pain and then also carries uh, non-pain signals deep touch um, so that that grouping does kind of make sense um, uh, in the sense that they're both deep um, in the compartments of the uh, of the limbs and the torso discriminative so it also carries discriminative touch so it allows us to specifically pinpoint where sensations are coming from and it also allows us to pinpoint or to detect where in three-dimensional space our limb and our body is so it's responsible for um, signals of proprio uh, reception now just to carefully sort of demonstrate how the cuneate fasciculus works um, let me just remove this one there so again let's draw a very anatomically correct person let's draw a nice anatomically correct and proportional head here and let's draw some arms and hands thighs over here lower legs alright now I want you to divide this human being at about the level of T6 which will be roughly over there because this is an important level in understanding the cuneate fasciculus and also the next fasciculus called the gracile uh, fasciculus so let's say you've um, well basically the cuneate fasciculus takes um, sensory information from the upper limbs and the neck and the upper chest um, and that's about it, it basically, the cuneate fasciculus ends at T6 so below the level of T6 you're not going to see any cuneate fasciculus in a cross section of the spine um, so it basically only goes up to T6 now let's say that um, you've broken your arm and there's some deep pain sensation over there this signal is then going to travel through the peripheral nervous system which we're not really going to go into in this lecture we're dealing only with the central nervous system it will enter the spine, it will enter the cuneate fasciculus tract and it will go up into the head now in the head 
when we enter the skull, we've got the medulla oblongata, um, the pons, the midbrain, we've got the thalami, below that we've got the thalamus, and then we've got our two cerebral hemispheres. And the reason I've told you all that is that in the medulla oblongata, this um, cuneate fasciculus uh, synapses at the cuneate nucleus. And then it decussates at that level, going up to the thalamus. The thalamus serves as the router for the brain, so it sends signals to the correct place. And from there, it then goes to the parietal lobe, specifically the postcentral gyrus, where it is interpreted as a sensory information and uh, localized to a specific part of the body. So that, in a nutshell, is how the cuneate um, fasciculus tract um, operates. Going to our next tract, our next tract is called the gracile fasciculus and it lies medially to our cuneates and it's also a fasciculus and guess what? It takes exactly the same sensory information, vibration, visceral pain, deep touch, discriminative touch and proprio uh, reception. Now uh, these two tracks are sometimes referred to, uh, as the posterior columns and sometimes also referred to as the dorsal columns. I don't like the term of dorsal columns because um, over here, we're going to be discussing the posterior spinal cerebellar tract, and that is sometimes referred to as a dorsal tract, and I find that people get confused between the dorsal column and the dorsal tract. So rather avoid that term dorsal, and refer to it as posterior columns and posterior spinal cerebellar tract, and then you're going to avoid that uh, unnecessary confusion. Now what does the gracile... Um, fasciculus do? Well, it takes all that sensory information but from below the level of T6. So at the level of T6 the cuneate fasciculus disappears um, but the gracile fasciculus is present all the way through down to the end of the spine and the gracile fasciculus does not take any information from above T6, it only takes information from below T6. And it's pretty much a similar process, so let's say we break our femur, that deep pain is going to go and enter the um, gracile fasciculus and it will then synapse at the gracile nucleus and decussates immediately joining the outflow of the cuneate nucleus and one of the things I forgot to mention is that this outflow is referred to as the medial lemniscus. So where those two outflows join up, that is the medial lemniscus. And then it goes up to the thalamus and to the postcentral gyrus. So I hope you enjoyed that very anatomically correct picture of a human being. Next up, um, let's discuss the anterolateral system. In other words, it's kind of anterior, but it's also kind of lateral, so it's the anterolateral system. And within the anterolateral system, there are two types of ascending tracts. First of all, spinothalamic, and also spinoreticular. And now we're going to names that actually um, 
correlate to the anatomy. So both of these guys begin in the spine. So they're both from the spine. The spinothalamic goes from the spine to the thalamus and the spinal reticula from the spine to the reticular formation in the brain stem. So they share um, space in the anterolateral system and it's difficult to separate the two tracts um, in that system. Discussing first the spinothalamic um, tract, the sensations that the spinothalamic tract carries are pressure, so it's P, pit, TLC. So first is pressure, next is pain, so it carries all types of pain, not just visceral pain, in contrast to the fasciculi, carries itch, which I suppose is a type of pain, and carries tickles, which I suppose is a type of itch, carries temperature, vital for homeostasis of body temperature, carries a light touch, and it carries crude touch. Okay, so at least the light touch and the crude touch uh, are sort of in op uh, opposites of the fasciculi in the sense that the fasciculi carry deep touch or the spinothalamic carries light touch and the fasciculi carry discriminative touch as opposed to the crude touch of the anterolateral system. And one of the features of the spinothalamic um, tracts, if we go back to our, our human being here, is that they decussate immediately. So if we have uh, an injury, uh, or let's say an itch, let's say we have a powerful itch, mightiest itch we have ever felt in our lives and all our hands and arms are tied to it together so we're not able, able to scratch that itch so it just gets worse and worse so this itch signal is going to go through the peripheral nervous system and it's going to enter the central nervous system and then enter the spinothalamic tracts and it will then immediately decussate to the opposite side and then our destination because of the spinothalamic tract is in fact the thalamus, so it goes straight all the way to the thalamus after decussating already at the same, pretty much the same level that it enters and then it will go to the um, cerebral cortex, the postcentral gyrus on the opposite side to the itch. The next one is the spinal reticular system, and the spinal reticular system uh, pretty much only carries one type of signal. It carries pain from injury. So if you are having pain um, due to an arthritis or something like uh, something sort of non-traumatic. Um, the spinothal or from ischemia, for example, the spinothalamic tract is going to carry that pain signal. But if you've been stabbed, as it were, or shot, that pain is going to be carried by the spinoreticular um, tract. And in the same way as the spinothalamic tract, the spinoreticular tracts decussate immediately um, from uh, uh, the they decuss it immediately upon entering the central nervous system. So let's give ourselves a gunshot wound over here. Nice little entrance wound. Pain is going to go through the peripheral nervous system and then it's going to enter the spinothalamic tract. It will decuss it immediately. And then it will go up and then synapse in the reticular formation which uh, spans uh, the brainstem and then from the reticular formation um, it will go to the thalamus and then to uh, the postcentral gyrus and it's probably a good idea that um, 
pain goes straight to your reticular formation if it's from injury. Um, if you think about the fact that um, um, uh, the reticular formation is responsible for keeping you awake, um, then it's probably a good idea that the reticular formation will activate if something is chewing your leg off or a rat is busy eating your nose or um, someone is stabbing you um, in your sleep, all things that I have actually seen in some uh, clinical cases, uh, by the way. Uh, it's probably a good thing that those traumatic injuries would suddenly jolt you awake, as it were, uh, by activating your reticular uh, formation uh, so that you can quickly and immediately fight it off. And it probably also explains why um, pain um, gives you a bit of a stimulating uh, effect and also explains why pain, um, severe pain perhaps, um, if it's from an injury, can also keep you awake and make it uh, difficult uh, to fall asleep because that pain is constantly in your reticular formation, constantly in your awareness. One thing I forgot to mention is that um, a lot of textbooks divide the ascending tracks into sort of three groups, posterior, um, anterior, lateral and lateral. So we've done posterior and we've done lateral. Some people might find that useful uh, in helping them memorize all the different tracts. Next up we're going to the spinocerebellar tracts, which are the anterior and the posterior cerebellar tracts and as I mentioned the posterior cerebellar tract is sometimes uh, referred to as the dorsal tract but I find that people confuse the dorsal tract with dorsal columns so I'd advise you to avoid um, that terminology. So we've got posterior and anterior spino cerebellar. So if we divide that into two, we've got tracks going from the spine to the cerebellum. So unlike the other tracks, these tracks are not going to go to your um, cerebrum or your cerebral cortex. They're not going to go to the um, postcentral gyrus. They are wired to go straight to the cerebellum. Now we know that the cerebellum is involved with um, controlling uh, and making movement smooth as it goes through three-dimensional space. So the cerebellum obviously is going to need information on where the limbs are in three-dimensional space. So these spinocerebellar tracts are pretty much only involved with proprioceptive signals going to the cerebellum uh, telling the cerebellum where the limbs are in three-dimensional space, allowing the cerebellum to fulfill its uh, function of um, maintaining um, smooth movements through three dimensions. Now the tracks, the spinocerebellar tracks are quite odd. And since this picture is getting a bit busy, let's choose a unique a special color. Let's use blue. So the functions of the anterior and posterior spinocerebellar tracts are not clearly sort of separated. They seem to take information, the same information as it were, from the limbs. There's, so there's a bit of duplication of systems there. Um, if you knock out your anterior spinocerebellar tract, your posterior cerebellar, spinocerebellar tract might be able to pick up a lot of the slack. And so you might not even have any clinical symptoms if you had an isolated lesion of just one of those tracts or if you were born with a congenital abnormality where you don't have a tract, for example. But let's say we've got um, some three-dimensional information here, some proprioception information in the arm and the cerebellum which is over here wants to know what's happening with that arm. Starting with the posterior spinocerebellar tract, that information is going to go from the peripheral nervous system into the central nervous system whereby it will then enter the spinocerebellar tract and we're dealing with the posterior spinocerebellar tract and the posterior spinal 
The posterior spinocerebellar tract does not decussate at all. It carries on in the spine on the same side as the um, information it's receiving, and it goes to the ipsilateral, in other words, goes to the same cerebellum um, hemisphere um, as the information that it's receiving. So the left uh, cerebellum controls the left arm and the left leg, unlike um, with the cerebral cortices whereby the right hemisphere controls the left side of the body. And that was the posterior spinal cerebellar tract. If we look at the anterior uh, spinal cerebellar tract, it's a little bit odd. Taking the same information about three-dimensional space, it enters the spine and then it decussates almost immediately and it goes up a bit into the spine and at some point it then redecussates. So it goes back and forth and it ends up in any case in exactly the same um, cerebral hemisphere as the posterior spinal cerebellar tracts. Uh, which is a bit odd, but I suppose the nice thing about this is that if you have a lesion of the spine only uh, affecting half the spine, say, on this side, um, you still got a backup mechanism on the opposite side of the lesion going to the um, cerebellum. So you'll find that hemi lesions of the spine uh, do not seem to give as much cere nice cerebellar clinical signs um, because there is that backup system available um, for the cerebellum. So those were the six um, ascending tracts. We've got the gracile fasciculus, cuneate fasciculus, two tracts of the posterior column. We've got the spinothalamic and spinoreticular tracts of the anterior lateral system. And we've got the anterior and posterior spinocerebellar tracts making our six um, ascending tracts. And now we are going to go into our descending tracts, our motoric tracts. Right, so moving on to motoric tracts, the descending tracts in other words, and because we're still sort of confined to the central nervous system, um, we're basically talking about upper motor neurons, so these uh, terms are pretty much synonymous. And the, the functions of these tracts are twofold. First of all, um, obviously they carry motor signals from the brain to the muscles of the body. But they also have something called descending analgesic pathways. Pathways. And these pathways can actually affect the functioning of the sensory tracts, the ascending pathways. Um, what they can do is they can actually suppress their functioning to reduce the um, transmission of pain uh, from the periphery to the brain. Now, in the same way that there are different types of touch that are carried by the sensory uh, nerves or sensory tracts, there's also different types of movements that are carried by the ascending tracts. And let's go through all of them. So, first of all, we got coarse movement. So coarse movement is, say, if you're trying to raise your arm in order to ask a question in class, does, class does, um, that involves quite a lot of muscles and quite a large sort of um, type of movement, so that's coarse movement. In contrast, we have fine movement. Those are the fine, small scale movements involving smaller groups of muscles or smaller muscles, uh, for example, for writing or for sewing. We have our reflexes. Uh, so reflex movements, movements that are sort of pre-programmed um, within, uh, within our central nervous system. We're so kind of born with these reflexes and they activate under certain conditions. Coordinative movements, so um, 
That is when one muscle wants to move and it requires the cooperation of other muscles, perhaps the relaxation of certain muscle groups, for example. Um, that, that in and of itself is a type of um, movement, so that's a coordinative movement. Initiation and cessation of movements are considered to be um, separate sort of uh, movement types as well. Balancing movements also exist, so uh, some muscles will receive um, signals that are dead purely just to keep your balance. And your brain has to actively inhibit um, muscles when they need to relax, so inhibition in and of itself is a type of movement signal sent by the central nervous system. And that's why when you die, um, after a while you get something called rigor mortis, when all the muscles become extremely stiff because the, um, the muscles don't even have any signal available to cause them to relax, um, so they become quite stiff. And unlike with the ascending tracts, um, whereby specific groupings are put with um, specific um, tracts, um, these movements are not um, are not as specialized in these ascending tracks. And as the ascending tracks are not, the ascending tracks carry all types. I mean, sorry, the descending tracks carry all types of movements. Um, they don't just carry specific uh, types. They're not specialized to carry specific types. Unlike the ascending tracks, descending tracks carry, can carry any and all type of movement. So let's discuss these um, ascending tracts. We're going to go through the five major ones. So there's five times major tracts. There are some minor tracts, um, but we're not going to discuss them because the clinical significance is not uh, really well defined. So let's go back to our cross section of the spine. And we've got our grey matter. And our spinal canal. So we're going to start off with the corticospinal tracts, or the pyramidal tracts, and we have a lateral and we also have an anterior corticospinal tract, so let's give this one a label, anterior corticospinal, over here is lateral. So let's quickly discuss how these guys work. So let's give ourselves a brain over here. Right cerebral hemisphere, left cerebral hemisphere, the thalami, hypothalamus, um, midbrain, pons, medulla oblongata, and spine. So we start off with a motor signal here and a precentral gyrus, which is where all motoric commands are uh, sent from. And this will then go via the thalamus and then from the thalamus down into the lower brainstem. Now at this point this tract it's just one corticospinal tract, it's not yet lateral or uh, anterior and in the lower brainstem part, some of it um, then starts to split apart um, so most of the tracts will decussate, about 90% of them will decussate in the level of the brainstem to form the lateral corticospinal tracts now if 90% of them are going um, and decussating at that point, that means that the lateral corticospinal tracts are actually 
carrying the majority of the motor signals of the brain. And you can even see uh, in this illustration how large the lateral corticospinal tract is compared to the anterior corticospinal tract. So the vast majority of motoric signals from the brain are carried through this lateral corticospinal tract and then they eventually synapse with a lower motor neuron um, going to the muscles. Uh, anterior corticospinal tract is a little bit odd. Um, okay, obviously the lateral corticospinal tracts go all the way down to the bottom of the spine. Anterior corticospinal tracts uh, tend to end somewhere in the mid-thorax level and the way they decussate is pretty much at random and varies dramatically from person to person some uh, pe people have anterior corticospinal tracts that do not decussate at all and then they supply the arms uh, and upper body uh, of the same side as the, where the signal is uh, originating from. So the right cerebral hemisphere will then be able to partly control the right arm through the anterior corticospinal tract. In some people, however, um, they do decussate at some point lower in the spine, so perhaps in some people it will decussate and actually control the arm on the other side. Remember, we're talking about mid-thorax level, so about T5, so obviously with, um, if the anterior corticospinal tract controls something, it's not going to be anything lower than uh, T5. And in some people, it actually uh, decussates and uh, carries on, so um, it actually has signals to both sides. Um, so then it would be, for example, this uh, right cerebral hemisphere will actually control the arms on both sides through the anterior corticospinal tract. It's not very dramatic though, so I mean it's only 10% of motor signals, uh, but it does mean that stroke lesions and brain damage can cause bizarre clinical presentations um, for the body above the mid-thorax. Um, for example, if we have a left stroke affecting the arm, 90% of the signals for the lateral corticospinal tract are going to be wiped out. But maybe, just maybe, uh, in this particular patient, he has the kind of anterior corticospinal tract that um, stays ipsilateral, and therefore he will still have about 10, that 10% 10 signal going to the right arm, and he may be able to get some partial recovery. Um, the arm will certainly probably be still weaker, but uh, he'll still have a little bit of function left, by about 10% of the function still. So, uh, unfortunately, I cannot tell you the exact levels and exactly how they decussate uh, because it's not really described in any textbook. Because, as I said, it displays so much inter individual variation that to say to create a sort of standard anatomical pathway is um, impossible. But that's about it for the corticospinal tracts. Remember that uh, by looking at the name, you can figure out sort of what its function is and where it's coming from, where it's going. Um, if we just divide it here, the first part of the name is from, so it's from the cerebral cortex, specifically the, precent uh, the, yeah, the precentral gyrus, as going down into the spine, so it's definitely a descending tract. Next one we're going to discuss is the tectospinal tract, which is, uh, oops, let me just add that tract over there and over there, and tectospinal tract is roughly around about there, so it's tectospinal, and this tract is only really present um, in the most upper part of the spine. Just going to demonstrate to you how the tectospinal works. So we've got the spine, we've got the medulla oblongata, pons, midbrain, hypothalamus, thalamus. And 
and superior, middle, and inferior peduncles and cerebellum. Now, tectospinal, if we look at the name and we divide it into two, it's from the tectum. So it's from the tectum down into the spine. Now, what is this tectum? Now, in the midbrain, there is four little structures, two for each side. Uh, that's referred to as the corpora quadrigemina, the four little bodies. And the, the top pair is actually referred to as the superior colliculi, and they're responsible for reflexes involving vision. And the lower pair is the inferior colliculi, responsible for reflexes involving um, hearing. And the region just underlying the corpora quadrigemina is referred to as the tectum. So this is where the, this tract actually begins. And it's in close association with the um, superior and inferior colliculi. And already we can guess that this tract is actually involved in reflexes, in reflex movements, um, depending on uh, what is stimulated through our visual reflexes or stimulated by our hearing reflexes. So if you hear a loud noise and you suddenly turn towards that noise, um, this is a track that's involved, or if a loud uh, flash of light causes you to turn your head, this is a track that's involved. So this tract um, will decussate almost immediately, so I'll just draw some little curves here to represent decussation and we'll then go down and exit in the upper part of the spine going to the muscles of the neck. So they're responsible for reflex um, head turns depending on visual and auditory stimuli. And that's pretty much it for the tectospinal tract. So now we're going to the reticulospinal tract, and there's two of them. We've got the lateral one somewhere around here, a little kidney shape there, and a little worm shaped here for the medial one, and on this side as well. And the sensory tracts are all scattered in and around these motoric tracts, um, and vice versa. So this one will be a medial reticular spinal. And over here is lateral reticular spinal. Okay, so let's discuss the reticular spinal tracts. So let's look at the name. It's reticulospinal. In other words, it's from the reticular formation in the brainstem going down into the spine. So we know it starts in the brainstem, so let's draw a brainstem, midbrain pons, medulla oblongata, and we've got a reticular formation scattered throughout this brainstem. And here it gets a bit tricky, but looking at just the one side, our lateral reticular spinal tracts um, will split in the brainstem. And what that means is that they do decussate, but they only decuss well, they partly decussate. Sorry, this is a terrible picture of a person, but I'm trying to draw some picture some shoulders and and a chest. Um, but what it means is that because it splits into two, it actually sends signals to 
both sides. And the reticulospinal tract only uh, sends um, information to the trunk and the proximal parts of the limbs. So um, it will also go down into proximal parts of the limbs and to various parts of the trunk. So the the right sort of um, uh, origin of a, a lateral reticulospinal tract will split to both sides. So it's actually the right side of the brainstem actually controls both sides and vice versa, the left side also controls both sides via the lateral um, reticulospinal tract. Whereas the medial tracts remain ipsilateral. So I'm just going to draw a little medial tract over here. And the medial tract for the right side is going to stay just on the one side. So um, unlike the lateral tracts, the medial sticks just to the one side, the ipsilateral side. So there's no crossover for the medial tract. And they are primarily involved um, in uh, two functions. So the functions, they're primarily, primarily involved with posture control. So they control all the muscles in order to make sure you have a good posture and that you're maintaining your posture adequately while you're assisting the orthopedic surgeon in the theater or the general surgeon or what have you. And then they also contain the descending analgesic pathways. So these guys actually um, can suppress um, the signals of pain going from the periphery uh, into the brain. And it makes sense if we compare the sensory tracts to the motor tracts, remember the spinal reticular going from the spine to the reticular formation and the spinal thalamic going to the thalamus both carry pain. And if you look at where the reticular spinal tracts are, they're actually right next to this major pathway for pain. So we can actually draw in our um, reticular spinal tract over here. So they're basically neighbors and buddies. Um, sorry, that end should actually be over here. And because they're so close to each other, it does make sense that the descending analgesic pathways will be in this uh, reticular spinal tract, able to affect the spinal reticular and spinal thalamic tracts that are right next door. And that's pretty much it for the reticular spinal tracts. And going on to the next one, and the second last one. It's the vestibulospinal tracts, and they are divided into lateral and medial. So here's the lateral, here's medial, lateral, medial. So let's just make the headings over here. So that will be medial, vestibulospinal, and lateral vestibulospinal. And if we divide the name, we, we already know that it's coming from the vestibular nuclei of the brain stem. So let's draw a brain stem. Midbrain, pons, the oblongata, spine, and in our brainstem we have four vestibular nuclei. Um, we have the superior vestibular nuclei, the lateral, medial and inferior uh, vestibular nuclei. And what do they do? Well they take information from the vestibular nerve which uh, goes via the vestibular cochlear nerve and that is for information necessary for balance so these guys are responsible for this particular tract is responsible for balancing uh, movements 
and the way it works starting off with the medial um, tracts so let's draw our medial tracts, they all join up to make the medial vestibular spinal tract the medial vestibular spinal tract leaves um, almost immediately uh, in the spine and it decussates to both sides so it swaps to one side and it also goes to the site of its um, origin and it only goes to basically the muscles of the neck and it controls head position so it's responsible for being able to balance your head and uh, just need to correct myself here, it doesn't actually exit the spine they actually synapse with interneurons and it's the interneurons that then send signals uh, through the normal lower motor neurons to the head basically altering the expression of your upper motor neurons so you'll have an upper motor neuron going here and synapsing to with a lower motor neuron and then you have this interneuron sort of in between the two and the effect is actually on the interneuron to ex uh, change the expression and communication between the upper motor neuron and the lower motor neuron and then the lateral one let's just get a different color the lateral one does not swap sides so it just goes straight down again synapses of interneurons so if our upper motor neuron is here joins up with an interneuron and then goes to a lower motor neuron the lateral vestibular um, the vestibular spinal tract affects the interfunctioning of the interneuron altering the communication between upper motor and lower motor neurons and these lower motor neurons are all involved with um, limb extensors so when you are losing your balance you automatically sort of fling your arms out, you extend your arms and that reflex is somewhat controlled by the vestibular spinal tract giving you an intuitive understanding of where your arms have to be in space in order to be able to not fall over so they send signals to your limb extensors giving you a strong sense of balance and how to correct your balance the last tract I'm going to discuss I'm not even going to draw I'm just going to discuss it in this little box here is the rubrospinal tract which is mentioned in almost every anatomy textbook it is um, however unclear whether it even exists uh, in humans it exists in four-legged animals that have to um, walk on all four legs um, and it's also present to a limited ex extent in monkeys it's unclear whether it really exists in humans and um, uh, it's a bit of a controversial thing at the moment because it's never been clearly dissected in human specimens and since we don't even know what it does, what it exists we're also not clear whether it would have a function if it is in human beings because um, as I said it's, me it's meant for posture control in four-legged animals we're not four-legged so why would we even need it even if it does exist it's possibly a vestigial tract um, but just to give you an idea of where it is so rubro is a word meaning red so it's from something that's red and that's because there's a red nucleus um, in our brainstem and we know if we do have lesions of the red nucleus there are some funny um, Motoric uh, problems such as athetosis, and some clinicians stated that no, the mirbo spinal tract must exist because if there's a lesion or red nucleus, um, there's clinical fallout. However, there's so many tracts that are running right next to the red nucleus and through the red nucleus that the question is whether it's an effect of the rubro spinal tract or whether it's something involving the tracts running through it or right next to it. In animal models it disappears in the upper spine 
So if it does exist in humans, it will only um, be affecting our upper body. And I don't really need to know this, I'm just mentioning it because it is mentioned in a lot of anatomy textbooks, um, but it is quite controversial and um, I personally am not going to ask about the rubrospinal tract, but in case someone, else, in case you do see it in another textbook, at least you're familiar with where uh, this tract is coming from. And that's pretty much it for the spinal tracts. We've just covered all the ascending tracts and we've done the descending tracts. And in terms of the sort of functional um, organization of the central nervous system, specifically of the spine, um, if you know this, you're probably already. Um, 90% ahead of most doctors, um, as it were.